everyone, and welcome to another episode of Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly, a podcast conversation with successful business owners who share their secrets of thriving in business while living with chronic illness. Here's Nancy Becker. Today, we're speaking with Claire Chandler, who's a leadership strategist who helps business leaders achieve financial and people stability. As president and founder of Talent Boost, Claire leverages 25 years of experience in human resources and communications to boost leadership effectiveness and cure workplace misery. She has extensive expertise in organizational effectiveness, including executive and leadership development, communication strategy, employment branding, talent and succession management, facilitation and training, career coaching, employee onboarding and engagement, customer relations, and human capital planning. (laughs) She is a certified senior professional in human resources. She holds a bachelor's degree in English from Fairfield University and a master's degree in professional and technical communications from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. She owns the company Talent Boost, where talent isn't born, it's boosted. Wow, fantastic. (laughs) That's great. Welcome, Claire, and thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Nancy. I'm psyched to be here and happy to spend time with you and your listeners today. Wonderful. It's it's, um, stuff that we all need to know and things that we don't necessarily know or want to know, but need to for our businesses to grow. So I'm looking forward to everything I can learn this afternoon. And Great. I am going to start out by asking you the question, why did you transition from a career in corporate America to starting your own consulting business? Wow. Way, way, way to just start with a zinger, right? And it's, and it's crazy. It's, a, it's crazy, right? In fact, when I, when I did it, uh, a couple of people, more than a couple of people said, what are you thinking? Um, you know, said, I, I sure hope you know what you're doing. Uh, you know, at my going away party from my, from my quote unquote, I'm using air quotes here, from my safe, cushy job in corporate America, my parents came to it and they pulled my mom aside and said, I hope she knows what she's doing, you know, kind of going out from this nice, stable company and and uh, you know, and and going into the to the great unknown of starting her own her own business. Hope she's got a plan. Um, and the fact was, I didn't. And and here's the reason I did it. So the year was 2011, and I was on a track to uh, become an executive in human resources. I was a VP at the time. Uh, I was traveling a lot. I was learning a ton, and I was going 110 miles an hour, Um, and that was awesome because I was going so fast and working so hard and traveling so much that I didn't have time to stop and think about whether what I was doing was what I was passionate about, and then I got a call that I had cancer. And I went from 110 miles an hour to had to stop everything, had to delegate everything to my amazing team. And thank God I had a great, great team who knew what they were doing, who who stepped up without even having to be asked. And I had to take a month off. I had surgery. I had follow up, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I went from 110 miles an hour to, to literally not looking at email for the first three weeks I was, you know, kind of rehabbing. And in that silence, I finally couldn't crowd out the question anymore. Was I doing what I was passionate about? And my answer was no. And so now that I finally had asked and answered that question, the next question logically was, okay, smarty, (laughs) what are you passionate about, right? And it was really all of those things that you listed in in the intro. It wasn't what I was doing right then. It wasn't what I was being groomed 
to become this soup to nuts HR executive in corporate America. So I spent the next, you know, the, the remainder of my uh, recovery period off of work um, reflecting on that, doing a little bit of research, having some conversations with some people about, okay, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Talk me out of it. Tell me I'm nuts. Um, call me crazy. And the people that I called, thankfully at that point said, you're not crazy. I've been waiting for this call because what you're, what you're suggesting is really what your gifts are. Um, and I went back, you know, into the office and negotiated a, a very long transition out. I had spent about 15 years there and, you know, moved on and, and left uh, in, in October of that year. So this was in mid-June and I, I stayed on until, until mid-October. And so just, you know, it, it, was, it took, though, cancer um, to kind of wake me up to the whole life is too short not to not to do it, not to take my leave. Yeah. And I and I think that's so important, but I think you did it the right way. So often people will just say, oh, I have this dream and they just jump right into something without thinking it out. And then they sit there going, what am I going to do now? You know? Sure. And sure. exactly what you're talking about resonates so much with me because there've been a couple of times when um, I had a very successful business going. I've always, I've had a couple of, when I was really young, I had a couple of jobs, but I've pretty much run my own business of some form or another since I was 12. So, you know, I, I know what it is to be in business for yourself. And twice I've gotten very, very sick and have lost my business and then had to figure out whether I wanted to do it again or not. And this last time I was in a car accident about five years ago, totally, I spent three years without even getting out of bed, you know, and that really has an effect on, you know, on you running your business and you have to just sit back and like you said, in the quiet. That's right. What you're doing and man, when you actually take the time to do that emotional work and to figure out the, the sensibilities of what you're doing, it really can create some amazing effects. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting and, and to, your, to your point, um, you know, whether it's cancer, whether it's a car accident, it, you, you will find that, and whether it's, business failure, you will find that that imposes new limitations on you. But you will also find if you look for it, it frees you up in other ways, right? Because it, it, it creates an opportunity, if you're open to it, to then narrow down your focus and say, okay, because of this limitation, or because of this constraint, or because of this shortcoming or failure or, or, or whatever it might be, <clears throat> excuse me, I now have to look at things in a different way. Mm -hmm. How am I going to overcome that? Mm -hmm. And some people choose not to do that. Some people choose to say, well, because of that, now I'm going to, you know, just wallow. And you, you can do that for a time, but then you got to, you know, put the big girl pants back on and, and get to work. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. There were only so many days that I could sit down there and that because we lived with my parents and my mom and my dad lived upstairs because we were there to take care of my folks. And we were living down in this dark basement and, you know, there were windows, but the windows were way up high and I'm sitting in this bed because I can't even get out. I can't walk up and down the stairs. I can't, you know, and, and it got to the point where you just say, there's only so many more days that I can sit here and watch TV and feel sorry for myself. Get up and get going. That's and right. Then you have to put it to work. The other thing that you said resonates so with me is when I was originally starting my business many years ago, my best friend was a government employee. She had a cushy job, right? She, you know, she could do almost whatever she wanted to. And she could not understand why I was putting in so much effort and so much work and so much money into running my own business. And she, I, you know, the number of times she would look at me and say, why don't you just go get a job? You know, <laughs> going, Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, 
it's just so I think there's there's a mentality out there for a lot of businesses and a lot of people who decide that they want to go into business for themselves, but they have to understand those things. And and that brings me to my next question, which is what was your biggest fear when you started out? You know, it, it, what's what's funny is my, I, I would have to say my biggest fear was that I wasn't going to do it. And I think honestly, you know, 2011 was, was without question the, the toughest year of my life. But it was also the most rewarding because I think had I not gone through the, the health situation that I did, I would not have had the quiet to listen to that voice in my head. And I probably would have stayed where I was. So my biggest fear was even in the quiet, even when I had the answer to the question, that I wasn't passionate about what I was doing, that I wasn't going to do it, that I was going to wait for a better time, you know? And, and it, it came down to the enemy that I think blocks the door for a lot of us who were debating making some sort of a leap in our lives. And that enemy, I realized, was two words, if only. Mm -hmm. If only I had more experience. If only I had more money saved. If only I didn't have more cancer treatments waiting for me, you know, in a month or two. If only I had the first clue how to build a consulting business, right? And I think, you know, the, the more I have talked to people over the years about their own journey, their own struggle with, you know, the, the, I'm sitting here and I'm not doing what I'm passionate about, or I was passionate when I got into this field and that fire has gone out. And I sit there and I talk to them about this enemy that's blocking their doorway called if only, and they sit there and they nod and they say, yeah, my if onlys are getting in my way. And I finally just said, F the if, F the if, because what you think is blocking the doorway is a shadow. It's a shadow. And so I just decided to, to take that leap. I said, forget that, forget the if only, F the if, and I just made the leap. I love that. I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that statement. <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. It's, it's so true, you know, and, and I think the accountability issue keeps coming up over and over and over again for me in this personal it's so i'm reading a book right now called the wisdom of oz i love the wizard of oz and there's so much in that book and in that movie that pertains to business for me you know and the the book is talking about you know where dorothy could have just given up she was now you know, she could have become the, what, the, the queen of munchkin land or whatever, you know, but she wanted to get to Oz. She wanted to go home and she put her little shoes on and started walking. She didn't allow that scary, wicked witch. And she didn't allow all this stuff to go on for her. She just said, F the F. And, that's right. You know, that's right. Kept on going. And I think that's one of the things that oftentimes we don't do that we need to just say, all right, let's, and, and the other thing that I use as, as kind of a, of a story behind all of this stuff is you are standing there beside this beautiful, clear pool of water and you want to go swimming so bad, but you're afraid that it's going to be cold, you know, and what do you do to, to, you know, do you really want to go swimming that bad that you're going to put up with for just a minute? Because once you get in that water, it's not cold anymore, you know, but do you, do you not go swimming because you're afraid of the cold or do you just say, I'm going for it and take the jump or do you one foot at a time, you know, and then just kind of sneak in. You know, people need to say, okay, I'm just going to jump into this. But I think they need planning first. They, they do. And I think, you know, for some people, the, the tiptoeing in and waiting in, you know, ankle deep first, work, you know, works better. I, I, I have a, a, a good friend of mine um, who is uh, still working at her full-time job, 
that she's not passionate about, but it is continuing to build up her experience. It's continuing to pay the bills while she on the side um, builds up her network and builds up her experience to go out on her own. Um, and that's an option for, you know, for a lot of people if they don't have either enough money saved, enough contacts established, et cetera. So it does, it, to me, it does depend, you know, on the person. I, I have to chuckle though at, at what you said before about, you know, people saying, you know, why don't you, why don't you go out and get a real job? The, the mindset shift has to happen first for you, right? You, you, you have to say F the if first, you have to overcome the, are, are you nuts to even think this way first? Because you are going to encounter other people outside of your own head who say the same thing. Well, if only the economy were stronger. Well, if only, you know, you, you actually knew a couple of things about this, that, or the other. Um, you know, I, 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 I've had a couple of people since I went into consulting who have said to me, it, it, only since I've been married, and I was not married when I first went into the consulting business. Uh, I am married now. And I've had, at least on two occasions that I can remember, people say to me, well, you're lucky because you're married, so you have the luxury of, of going out and trying this consulting thing because you have a husband to support you. And would it shock you to learn that the two people that have said that to me were women? And I find that alarming. Yeah. I find it alarming. And, uh, you know, I, I, I corrected them without getting defensive about it, you know, to say, uh, you know, I, I took this leap of my own free will and volition well before my husband was a speck on the horizon, God love him, um, you know, and, and, you know, did that of my own skill and my own will and all of that. Um, and this is not you know, a, a, a hobby, like, you know, I, I, I started a gardening club because I was bored and we didn't need the income. I, I, but it's, but it's, you know, to your point about, I think a lot of people that don't have the, um, the bug for going out on their own, that entrepreneurial bug, or maybe do, but never really to the point that they're, they're going to take the leap. They run into that. They run into the, oh, but that's not really a job. That's a whim. That's a hobby. That's a, uh, you must be lucky because you must be independently wealthy that you can pursue, um, you know, these flights of fancy. Growing a successful business is hard enough, but trying to do it while adjusting to a new challenge like a chronic illness can definitely derail the best of us. Nancy understands. She has been there, done that. With 30 years of success, she knows the necessary business hacks to increase your income and relieve the day-to-day -day stress of running a business, all while living in an uncooperative body. Nancy can help you. Connect with her today through the links in the show notes so you can see your business soar higher. This is, this is a job. If I don't work, if I'm not good at what I do, if I don't sell in addition to deliver to existing clients, I don't bring an income. And so it's, it, it's just, it was, but it's alarming to me, some of those voices. So your, your mindset shift has to happen in your own head first. And you have to have that confidence because then that starts to exude. And then those other, if onlys that you start to hear from other people don't matter so much. Right. Yeah. You have to be able to, and I've just actually been realizing this recently with everything that I've been going through is for the longest time, those external voices were really, you know, they'd say, well, who are you and why do you think that I ever would want anything you have to offer? And then I go, yeah, you know, I'm going, ah, oh. and, and you hear those things often enough especially in the, in the consulting or in the coaching field where there are so many of us out there, you know, and, and this is from one coach to another. And, you know, they're obviously just feeling fear or something themselves to say something like that, but you hear it often enough. And if I hadn't felt so passionately about it, 
I probably would still be downstairs in my dark little bed and, you know, not ever doing anything again. So I, I'm learning so much that mindset really is an important part of what we're doing if we want to get out there and be in business for ourselves. I think it, it, it's, a, it's a huge, it, it is the start. If, if you're not passionate, you can't be an entrepreneur. You can't be a business owner if you're not passionate at your core about what you offer and what you do, because your clients will, will, will see that. And you can't deliver on something you don't buy into when you're a, when you're a company of one, you just can't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've gotten recently where, you know, I would, my, my tagline for years has always been, don't wait till pigs fly. And people would say, oh, that's just stupid. That's not professional. That's, I actually had somebody say that to me the other day. And I finally got to the point where I went, screw you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that's my tagline. I stand behind it. And that's what it's going to be. I'm not letting somebody else tell me again, you know, that I have to do it another way. And when you feel that authenticity, when you feel that, passion and that belief it's amazing yeah you know what happens it's oh yeah really oh yeah and and I you you hit the nail on the head with the word authenticity I I think when you when you first strike out on your own um I know it was it was true for me I was I was pretty clear on all of the things that I knew how to do and so it wasn't about you know, I didn't have a brand. I didn't have um, any sort of brand reputation, right? So it was really about going out and bringing in business in whatever way I could, which was to go out and try to find, um, you know, the entrepreneurial equivalent of odd jobs. So it was, you know, everything from um, grading papers for online universities to editing and uh, developing resumes um, you know, to, you know, some other freelance copy work, you know, anything that would start to bring in some money so that I could mentally build up some confidence that, you know, I can go from an, a, an entire career of having a full-time salary to just out on my own, bringing in some sort of revenue. And then it started to, you know, to, to, to snowball from there. But when you're first starting out, you're so keen on, you know, here's, here's what I can do versus here's what I believe. And the authenticity element of that is so critical because the, the more you are in touch with who you are, and I think you, you and I are, are, you know, through our, our sort of mutual um, development path that we are on, are getting more and more attuned to why it's so important to stay in touch with who we are, what we believe, what we stand for, and what we don't. Um, the right clients, right? The right people will be attracted to us and the wrong people will be repelled by our message. So that one who said, what do you mean that, you know, when pigs fly, blah, 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 that's, that's not professional, then that's not the client for you. They're constantly going to be uh, the, the fly in the ointment. So, and I have to say something else about, you know, this, this thought of, it, it, it took me a good couple of, I'm going to say more than a couple, a good number of years as a consultant to overcome the fraud complex. <laughs> and the way I define the fraud complex and any business owner goes through this, when you go out on your own and you leave the relatively safe bubble of getting a regular paycheck to do what you do, you know, which, which as we know from certain movies that are quite satirical, you get rewarded for doing the bare minimum that does not get you fired, right? As a business owner slash entrepreneur, you have to stay hungry, you have to be creative, and you have to be damn good at what you do. And so the fraud syndrome is when I pull up to a client site and I'm walking in the door, I have that little voice in the back of my head going, is today the day? Is today the day that the client realizes 
that Claire is a fraud, that Claire is making this up as she goes, that Claire doesn't really know as much as she projects that she knows. And again, that's mindset, right? Again, it's the, it's those voices in my head that I swear they can actually hear and they're just going to repeat. And now this is the day I'm going to be thrown out. And I think every business owner goes through that to some degree. Um, I don't know if that's what you've called it, if you've gone through that, but this, that fraud complex is, is very real and you have to figure out a way to beat that back. Well, and that's what I was saying was that it was excruciatingly painful for me. And I still, to this day, hear it over and over again. Who the heck do you think you are and why should I listen to you? You know, and, and if you allow those voices, you're never going to be able to succeed. You have to get to the point where you said, I am a damn good consultant. I know what I'm talking about. And if you listen to me, you'll grow your business. But you right. have to believe that. You have That's to right. feel that, you know? That's right. And, and you have to, again, with the, with the concept of, of being authentic and being true to yourself and what you are passionate about, mm -hmm. you, you have to stay very true to the clients you truly believe you can serve and the result that you truly believe you can get them. And part of that is, and I've, I, you know, it's, it's, I want to say I've learned that I'm still learning it and I'm learning it over and over in a new and deeper ways every day, but it's, it's learning to, to go to where they are. Right. So it's not about me coming up with an offer and, and pushing it out there and hoping it sticks and then, you know, cringing that it's going to fail because I, I oversold it to the wrong people. Right. It's about being authentic with my message and my offer. And that's great but connecting with the right client, hearing where they are now, right? Meeting them where they are, where they need to get to, and really listening and not with a purpose of, okay, I'm just going to wait for them to stop talking and then hit them with my cell, right? Mm -hmm. Where they need to get to, and then making a decision on, can I get them there? Can I close that gap for them? And then having that conversation. And it's a completely different it's a completely different approach than I've got something to sell because I need the money or I have something to offer because every client is a good client. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and it's just when you project your feelings, your beliefs, your authenticity, then people are going to just start flocking to you. And I'm seeing that more and more every single day that I'm out there. And, and real quick tip, guys, if you're on Facebook, if you're on LinkedIn, start showing up in a few different groups that you belong to. And don't do sales. Talk. Share comments and thoughts and answer other people's questions with no concept of I'm doing this so you'll hire me. And it's, it's fantastic. What happens? Have, have you found that to be the same? Yeah, I, I have. And, and I've done it the other way with, with complete failure. So I, I've done, um, you know, the, the chiming in on posts with the, um, what I thought was a subtle attempt at selling and apparently was not <clears throat> and, and had crickets. And then I've had other, um, you know, seemingly innocuous, chiming in on a, on a post where I, I was not selling, I was not intending to sell, I just felt driven to respond to something because it was something I believed strongly about um, and, and not controversial, just, you know, either echoed a sentiment or commented on something. And it was that kind of a post, exactly to your point, that I turned around and someone saw what I commented and went and checked me out, checked out my LinkedIn profile, went to my website and downloaded my lead magnet. And I thought, well, that was easy. That was almost too easy. I didn't even try on that one. All the ones I was trying too hard for fell flat. So it, it, yeah, and I think again, that was a, it's a lesson in, in authenticity that the harder you try to sell, the more people are going to be turned off by that. Well, and I think uh, you can feel your desperation. Absolutely. You know? Oh, I need to make a sale. I need to. That's right. <laughs> That's absolutely right. To do with you, you know. So, yeah. 
you need to be, again, I, I don't know what other word to use other than authentic and, and honesty and integrity too are big. Yeah. That. Well, and, and it's, and it, and they all go hand in hand, right? It is so much easier to be honest when you believe in, in your message. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so much easier to quote unquote sell when you're being authentic. I was having a conversation with a client uh, not too long ago and we were just mingling socially. So I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't sitting there trying to sell her. And I just, you know, I, I said something to her about, you know, I, we're, we're, we're sitting here, we're having a cocktail. And this is about the time that, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be trying to get more business out of you. I said, but I, I don't want to do that. And I said, quite frankly, I don't know how to do that because I don't, I don't really do sales. I don't know how to do sales. I said, I get caught up in the work. I just enjoy working with you. And, and her response was very telling. She said, the fact that you don't do sales, quote unquote, is why you're so good at it. She said, because I never, when you're in the room with me, I know that you know what you're doing and I breathe easier because you always help us get to where we need to go. And I never feel like you're selling. And it was just, it was very, um, it was flattering for one thing, but it was just, it was reassuring because I'm sitting here going, I'm probably supposed to try to market her or sell her or what, and I don't know how to do that. All I know how to do is be me and, and be attracted to the work that I know I can bring value to. So put me in a room where I get to do that and I light up. Um, right? uh, Absolutely. <laughs> And that's, and that's what it should always be about. Yeah. Yeah. I got yeah. goosebumps from just listening to that comment. So yeah. You know, yeah. It's real. It's, it's something we all need to listen to. And yeah, I had not thought about talking about these things when we were uh, getting you signed up for the, the show today. We were going to talk about what you do, <laughs> you know, but, but I think this is really important stuff and things that people need to hear about. But with our last few minutes, I am going to transition a little bit sure. and ask you to tell us what it is you really do. You know, what Absolutely. does Talent Boost do for people? Absolutely. So Talent Boost um, primarily is all about helping leaders create what we call the whirlpool effect. So leaders who, and we, and we target um, or, or, or work with three main types of leaders. So these are leaders who either are struggling leaders. So leaders who, for one reason or another, are underperforming, you know, themselves or through their teams, whether it's financially, whether they're, uh, you know, they're losing employees, uh, they're not getting the, the revenues they're supposed to be getting, etc. So there's the struggling leaders. There's a second category that I would call transitional leaders. So leaders that uh, have uh, assumed a larger uh, leadership role. So whether they're leaders of leaders, or maybe they've been assigned to run a new division, um, you know, it's it's so often we fall into the trap of, well, they were they were a great manager. Let's make them a big leader, and let's just assume they know that you know what they're doing, and they'll be a huge success. Um, and so you know, we know that that's often a, a recipe for failure. So there's a there's a there's kind of a pain point there. And then the third category is what I call the evolving leader. So leaders who uh, have a relatively stable company or, or division or, or team, um, but they're, they're feeling like it's time to scale, it's time to grow, it's time to add a product or service line. Um, and so we work with these leaders on, uh, through a structured program. Uh, on the one-on-one -on -one program, it's a six-month program. And then on a group program, it's six to 12 months, depending on the need. And we take them through a structured methodology to implement a new leadership strategy. So the Whirlpool Effect program is not a development program. It's not a coaching program. It doesn't teach them how to recruit or discipline or anything like that. It is truly uh, a leadership strategy implementation that helps these leaders um, it really changed the way that they lead so that their people truly follow them. Because the only way that they can create the whirlpool effect is if they can get their people truly behind them, truly behind their mission, and everyone on board and moving in the same direction. 
Um, and I and I call it that because if you if you think back to when you were a kid and you were in a swimming pool with your friends, invariably somebody would shout, "Let's make a whirlpool!" And so everybody would just automatically just start trotting in a, in a circle. Didn't matter which way, clockwise, counterclockwise, but everybody just automatically knew what that meant. And you started to go around in, the, in a circle. And after a few laps, you were able to pick up your feet and just get carried along in the current. And that's what leadership is supposed to be like. And too often, all of these types of leaders find themselves fighting what I call churn. And it's, you know, whether it's underperformance, whether it's, you know, trying to grow before your team is ready, whether it's biting off more of a leadership role than, than, you, than you really were prepared for. Um, and so it's all about creating this, this whirlpool effect that truly is the way to get to amazing results in your business. So that's really the core um, offering, if you will, um, that we do. So if, you know, can I, can I plug my website? I don't know if that's yep. allowed. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I was just going to ask you that. So yeah. Okay. I didn't know if that was, if that was part of the rules. Um, but yeah, if, if any of your listeners are, are interested in learning more about that or about uh, what we do in general, um, they can go to our website, talentboost.net. Uh, you can learn about uh, the Whirlpool Effect program. Uh, you can also read about the Whirlpool Effect. There's a book. Uh, the ebook version is free. You can download it right off of the website. Fantastic. And what is your email address? My email address is Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at talentboost.net. Perfect. Guys, I highly recommend that you take advantage of downloading the ebook and reading it. Uh, one other question before we close up. If you're a sole proprietor, do you need to have leadership skills? Oh, no question. No question. And I'm going to tell you the first person you've got to lead is yourself, right? Um, the, the, the leadership mindset is so, so important. You know, we, we, we talk about, and, and I kind of talk about through the program and even through the description of the program, if you go to the website, that I have had the experience, I think we've all had the experience of working with great leaders. And I've also worked for a bunch of jerks, right? Narcissists, um, people that are, are famous for saying, do as I say, not as I do. Um, that is very toxic and your people aren't gonna follow you. If you are a sole proprietor and that is your mentality, it, it is as toxic when you're a sole proprietor as it is when you have a company of 10,000 because that's what you project, that's what your clients feel, that's what the people around you feel. And you're, you know, what we have talked about through the duration of this podcast is you attract what is authentic to who you are and what you're sending out into the world. Um, so, you know, really kind of reflect on what you want to send out into the world because we, we only get one shot at this. We can keep evolving and reinventing who we are, but go after what you're passionate about. Be passionate about that. But I really advise against being passionate about being a jerk. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's why I asked that question because a lot of my listeners are one person shows, you know, and, yep. and they might have thought, well, you know, we've been talking about teams and we've been talking about leadership and there's got to be somebody there to lead. So this isn't important to me, but it absolutely is. I mean, from, from the minute, from the minute we get up out of bed in the morning, whether we've got a business or not, we need to lead or we're just yeah. in bed. Oh, absolutely. I, and, and the self-leadership, I mean, the self-management, you know, one of the biggest uh, adjustments for me moving from, you know, a corporate job where my schedule was, was predetermined, right? The alarm went off at zero dark 30, right? You got up and maybe you had breakfast or you, you opted not to, so you could get a couple more minutes in, but, you know, of sleep. And then, you did the commute and you traveled either to the corporate office or you, you went to the airport and you did your thing. Um, when that shifted to, I was the maker of my schedule, right? And I, um, I run my business out of my home. So in between podcasts and other calls and other meetings and other work, I'm running and doing laundry. I'm running to the supermarket. I'm planning the meals. I'm, you know, whatever. 
you, you the, the self-management of your business is even more critical because you don't have a staff, because you don't have somebody who's coming into your doorway and saying, uh, it's time for you to go to that meeting, or you know, it might be time for you to check in with that client and make sure everything's okay. It's all on you to balance that. Um, that does not mean you don't have other resources at your disposal. And I think it's one thing that um, I, I learned a little bit later and I, you know, in, in hindsight, it's something I should have done a little bit sooner in my consulting journey is bring in more guides, not bring in staff. Um, but it's so, it's so tempting to just say, nope, I got it. I'm going to go out on my own and start my own business and handle everything because I'm superwoman and I'm going to show the world and I'm going to prove to everybody that I, you know, that I'm not crazy, that this wasn't a stupid idea and that I'm not going to fail. Right? Um, but you absolutely need, need guides. I mean, one of the, one of the things I just read the other day, which was so true is if you, if you own a business and you're working on your business, you have to work on your business as much as you're working to build the business, right? So it's a hard concept when you're first starting out to invest in yourself, but it's so critical. It's so critical to get those other voices, those positive voices that are going to push you and challenge you and ask you questions and make sure that you're growing in the right direction. And can I use that in my marketing? Because that's absolutely perfect. For the 11th year now, I have run a business retreat. That's the dream big retreat. And the whole purpose of that retreat is to get people working on their business. Not absolutely. In their business. And people say, I, you know, I don't get it. I'm too busy, you know, doing the work. I'm too busy doing this. And they don't get the fact that, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have these guides, if you don't know, you know, what do you do if tomorrow you're told you've got cancer? How are you going to run that business? Do you have something set aside so you know that that business is going to be okay while you're needing extra support? Right. But people don't, but people don't get it. So you're so right on with that. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. No, I know it's, it's a lesson that I've had to learn. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I, I think is such a gem from your podcast is just sharing, sharing these little nuggets that we don't often take the time to, to, to hear for ourselves. And as business owners, it's so, it's so critical to, to learn from others. So we're not tripping over the same landmines. Yep, absolutely. Well, listen, it is, we're running out of time. So it is time for me to say thank you. This has been an absolutely fantastic discussion. And I've learned so much. And I've been able to say, I knew that. That's really good that somebody else says the same thing. That I <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. And I appreciate the time. And I, I as, as we have talked in our last conversation, I could talk to you all day. So it was absolutely a pleasure. Well, wonderful. And guys, if you want to download this and listen to it, subscribe to the podcast at Don't Wait Till Pigs Fly. And until the next time we get together, don't wait till pigs fly, but soar higher now. Thank y'all. And we will talk again soon. Take care.